Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. Welcome to Sahih al-Bukhari, Kitab al-Iman for the new semester. So with this, this is our final new class of the semester. We formally began all the other classes. And uh, this is the first session of Sahih al-Bukhari. And for this particular seminar, just a few things that will be different from the previous seminar. Um, we're no longer going to do the introduction. Um, we did a lot of introductory material regarding Sahih al-Bukhari, which still applies to this particular um, seminar. But having done that, now we can just begin reading the hadith and discussing them. So we're going to try to finish Kitabul Iman. It's about, I forgot, I counted 58 hadith, I believe, something like 50 plus hadith in this chapter. So in 12 sessions was 50 divided by 12, about five to seven, right? We need to finish five to seven. So let's try, let's try. Next week we'll begin 8.15 instead of 8.30. So 8.15 we'll begin and uh, we'll pray at eight o'clock downstairs and we'll begin 8.15 inshallah. And we, we may adjust it here and there because there's a previous class that a lot of people were here for and just we need to like have a better workflow. So Bismillah, who wants to read? Uh, we're going to read the entire Tajumatul Bab, Bab, uh, the Bab, the first Bab of Kitabul Iman, and hopefully the first Hadith today. Any volunteer? I think there was a sister online wanted to read. Okay, may I try? Yeah, go ahead. So the Arabic. Bismillah. Okay, sure. Babul <clears throat> Imani وقول النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بني الإسلام على الخمس وهو قول وفعل وزيد قول وفعل وزيد وينقص قاض الله تعالى شيطان الجين وليزداد إيمانا مع إيمانهم وزدناهم هدى ويزيد الله الذي نهتدوه yeah, um, huda. Uh, huda. Okay, um, sorry. Wa yazidu فأما الذين آمنوا فزادتهم إيمانا وقوله جل ذكره, ذكره فخشوهم وزادهم إيمانا وقوله I'm sorry فزادهم فزادهم إيمانا وقوله تعالى وما زادهم إلا إيمانا إيمانا وتسليما Okay, let's stop there. Um, we'll continue. Um, another reader. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, Imam al-Bukhari begins Kitab al-Iman now. What was the first chapter? Kitab Bad al-Wahi, how revelation began. So, systematically, Imam bukhari is trying to teach us the basics and foundations, and there is a method to all of this. Um, so, you have to understand the connections. So, you know, Kitab al-Wahi was very much a preamble to make make us understand the nature of revelation, the nature of where knowledge comes from. And, and having laid that foundation, what is the very first thing that he begins with? That's Kitab al-Iman. That tells you how important, the most important topic for Imam Bukhari to teach us is Iman. And no doubt, Iman is the greatest topic uh, the greatest thing in the life of the believer. So Kitab al-Iman is the very first uh, chapter in the Sahih. So the Bab, Bab al-Imanu, uh, Bab al-Iman, wa qawli nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bunya al-Islamu ala khams. So the title of the chapter is Al-Iman and the statement of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
verily Islam is built upon five. Islam is built upon five. So this is the name of the chapter. So this is how Imam Bukhari chapters and uses titles. He's not interested in aesthetics. He's interested in teaching you uh, what he needs to teach you. So the chapter is called Al-Iman and the statement of the Prophet that Islam is built upon five. So there's a lot of lot to unpack there. Um, you know, so you might look at the hadith and say, wait, wait a minute, this is Islam. The hadith is telling you Islam is built upon five pillars, but the chapter is titled Iman. So if you're approaching the Sahih from your own uh, angle, in your own ideas, then a lot of things will not make sense. Kind of like in Tafsir, we said, it's very similar to what we said in Tafsir. When you read the Quran, come to the Quran and read it on its terms, and you have to approach the Quran with a free mind. And that applies to any book, any book that you're trying to learn, and something as great as Sahih al Bukhari, you need to come to it and learn the Sahih without your preconceived notions. So, all of us have definitions in our mind of what Iman is, what Islam is. Now I need to not throw them out. Maybe that's a strong word, but put them to the back. Now just learn. Let's absorb. Let's learn uh, what Imam Bukhari wants to teach us. Let's listen to the verses. Let's listen to the words of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So uh, if you're accustomed to th doing things systematically and doing definitions, then you're going to have a lot of trouble with this book. So in this particular preamble, so this is a long preamble. Like we mentioned, uh, Tarjumatul Bab. You know, Imam al-Bukhari was a master at two things. He was able to give us the most sound reports from the Prophet Wasallam with his best expertise, and no one beat him on that. So he is a muhaddith. He is a hadith expert par excellence. So the reports in the Sahih are the best, the Sahra Sahih. But at the same time, I mentioned the previous um, introductory seminar that Imam Bukhari was also a faqih. Not only he had deep knowledge of hadith, he has deep knowledge of fiqh. And fiqh is deep insight into the deen. So he's trying to teach us much more than just the reports. He's trying to put them together in an organic whole and he's trying to teach us many, many things. And for teaching, sometimes, you know, you have to use words, you have to use expressions. Sometimes you have to use information and material that's not part of the main text. Um, so had it been just a manual of hadith, he would have just gave you all those hadith. Then how do you put them together? What do they mean? So what he's, he does is he divides them into chapters and he gives these long lengthy titles of the chapters and he gives his vision and some preamble and a lot of introductory material in, within these chapters. They're called Tarjumatul Bab. That's why that statement I mentioned, Fiqhul Bukhari fi Tarjumatihi, fi Tarajumihi. Fiqhul Bukhari fi Tarajumihi. The real genius of Bukhari and his insight shows in his chapter headings. Tarajum or Tarjuma is that chapter heading. So this is where he produces his material. Uh, he'll put verses of Quran there, he'll put his vision, he'll put some introductory material, and he'll quote statements of companions, he'll quote other material that's not part of his primary corpus. So when you're reading Sahih Bukhari, and most of, well, everything we read so far, and there's still more, still part of that chapter heading, still not his primary hadith. So you can't take a, a portion out of this and say it's in Sahih Bukhari and it's the most authentic because you have to understand the structure of the book. Again, going back to the structure. I don't have slides uh, in this seminar. We're just going to be reading the hadith and just uh, discussing that because like Imam al-Bukhari, I'm not that concerned about aesthetics right now. So just we need to learn the material. We need to get into it without any uh, distractions. So Imam Bukhari spells out his vision of what Iman is. This is his vision of what Iman is and what he learned, what he believes Iman is from the Quran and the Sunnah. And it's something vast and it's something grand. So, Babul Iman, Waqawli Nabi Bunya al Islam wa ala khams. The chapter is entitled Al Iman and the statement of the Prophet that Islam is built upon five. 
And then he says, وَهُوَ قَوْلٌ وَفِعْلٌ وَيَزِيدُ وَيَنْقُصُ And it is statement and action. It increases and it decreases. What is it? وَهُوَ What is that going back to? Al-Iman. Yeah, Iman. So we're going to use the word Iman because how do you translate it? Belief or faith or... It's hard because all of those terms have their own connotations and they create problems understanding what really Iman is because... You know, when you have, when you approach Iman from your English term or whatever conception you have, then there's already we saw a potential problem where Islam is built upon five pillars. What do the five pillars of Islam have to do with Iman? Because we were accustomed to categorizing them and separating them. Then he quotes Qala Allah Ta'ala in a number of verses, لِيَزْدَادُوا إِيمَانًا مَعْ إِيمَانِهِمْ So that their Iman will increase... Um, this is an Arabic expression. Iman will be added to their Iman. Their Iman will continue to increase. Then there's another verse, وَزِدْنَاهُمْ huda. We will increase them in guidance. There's another verse, وَيَزِيدُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ اهْتَدَوْ huda. Allah increases those who adopt guidance, their guidance. Then another verse, وَالَّذِينَ اهْتَدَوْ زَادَهُمْ هُدًا وَآتَاهُمْ تَقْوَاهُمْ those who seek guidance, adopt guidance, Allah increases them in guidance and Allah will grant them their taqwa, the state of taqwa. Another verse, وَيَزْدَادَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا imana. They will increase iman to their iman. Their iman will increase. And then, وَقَوْلُهُ أَيُّكُمْ زَادَتْهُ هَذِهِ imana. فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فَزَادَتْهُمْ imana. Which of the which one of them increases in this faith, in this iman? amanu fazadathum imana. As for those who adopted iman, we increase them in iman. jalla dikruhu fakhshawhum fazadahum imana. When it says uh, so, these verses he's quoting portions of the verses. It would make sense, but in the interest of time, we won't do it here. But if you're studying the Sahih, look up each verse, read the entire verse. And read the verse before and after to give you context. But he's quoting just the verse. Fakhshawhum uh, fazadahum imana. This is when people in the Khandaq, they were saying, hey, all the people are gathered against you, you should fear them. And when they said that to the believer, the real believers, fazadahum imana. The iman actually increased. ta'ala, wa ma zadahum illa imanan wa taslima. Their iman and their taslim, submission, increased. So these are a number of verses that he shares, but um, should we read the whole Tarjumatul Bab and then do the intro, or should we? Okay, someone someone read the rest of it. Let's translate all of it, and then uh, we'll do our uh, explanation, inshallah, bit by bit. So someone from this audience, read the rest of from Wal Hubbu Fillahi Wal Bughdu Fillah. Anyone? Yeah, give him the microphone. Where's the mic? He has Walhubu Fillahi Wal Bugdu Fillahi Min al Iman Wakataba Umar Ibn uh Abdil Aziz Ila Adi Ibn Adi in Lil Imani Faraid Wa Sharai Wahududan Wasunanan Feminis Feminis Tak Laha Tak Malaha Feminis Tak Malaha Is Tak Mal Is Tak Mal and Iman Woman Lam Yastak Milha Lam Yastak Milil Iman Fa in Aish Fasa Ubayina Ubayinohum Fasa Ubayina Ubayinoha Fasa Ubayinoha Lakum Hatta Tamalu Biha wa in a mut fama ana ala suh batikum bahi biha biharisin biharis biharis wa kala Ibrahim wala 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 kin liyato ma inna kalbi wa kala muad. Ijlis bina nu'min sa'atan wa qala ibn Mas'ud 
اليقين الإيمان كله وقال ابن عمر لا يبلغ العبد حقيقة التقوى حتى يدع ما حاك في الصدر وقال مجاهد شرع لكم أو صيناك يا محمد يا محمد وإياه دينا واحدا وقال ابن عباس شرعة شرعة ومنها ومنهاجا سبيلا وسنة وسنة. Good, جزاك الله خير. Okay, so let's do a quick translation. والحب في الله والبغض في الله من الإيمان. So he says, loving for the sake of Allah and hating for the sake of Allah is from iman. Then he says, وكتب عمر بن عبد العزيز إلى عدي بن عدي. And Umar ibn Abdul Aziz wrote a letter to Adi ibn Adi in which he wrote, Inna lil imani, inna lil imani, fara'ida, verily iman has fara'ida, obligations, shara'i'a, laws, hududan, limits, wa sunanan, and, practice, and practices. Faman istakmalaha, istakmal al iman. Whoever completes all of that completes his iman. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَسْتَكْمِلْهَا لَمْ يَسْتَكْمِلِ الْإِيمَانِ And whoever does not complete it, does not complete Iman. فَإِنْ عَيْشْ فَسَيُبَيِّنُهَا لَكُمْ حَتَّى تَعْمَلُوا بِهَا If I live long enough, I will explain all of that to you so that you may practice it. وَإِنْ أَمُتْ And if I happen to die before that, فَمَا أَنَا عَلَى صُحْبَتِكُمْ بِحَدِيثِ Then I'm not that... Uh, how would you translate that? I am not eager to be in your company. So <laughs> I am not eager to be in your company. Um, Ibrahim and Ibrahim said, qalbi," but only to increase my, uh, only to bring tranquility to my heart, to increase my certainty. And then Wakala Muad Muad ibn Jabal he said, "Ijlis bina nu'minusar." He said to someone, "Come, let's sit." and believe for a moment so which means let's sit and refresh our iman for a moment and then وقال ابن مسعود اليقين الإيمان كله يقين or conviction or certainty is all of iman وقال ابن عمر لا يبلغ العبد حقيقة التقوى حتى يدع محاق في الصدر ابن عمر said a servant does not attain the completion of taqwa until he leaves what wavers in his heart and then وقال مجاهد مجاهد said شرع لكم concerning this verse شرع لكم من الدين this verse we have ordained for you and the prophets before you and when he said when he said قال مجاهد we just had our tafsir class remember I said Sufyan al-Thawri said إذا جاءك قولا عن مجاهد فحسبك به if مجاهد brings you a statement it's enough for you because he is Imam al-Mufassirin he is the best student of Ibn Abbas radiallahu an, and he was inherited the school of tafsir in Mecca. And uh, so here, I, I mentioned to you, was, I, I forgot that Mujahid is in here. I said, you will find these names a lot in the tafsir and even books of hadith, because these are the references to tafsir uh, of the Quran. So here you have your first example. Mujahid is ex giving the tafsir of this verse, Shara alakum, which means, we advise you or ordained upon you, O Muhammad, and him. And who's him? Nuh. If you look at the whole verse. Deen and Wahida. One and one deen for both of you. And neither a verse of the Quran that mentions law, shiratan wa minhaja and methodology. Ibn Abbas's interpretation was that it means sabilan, a path and sunnatan, a tradition, a path and a tradition. And then, babu du'aukum imanukum. Your du'a is your iman. So this is a lengthy introduction to iman. So it's a lot of dis disjointed elements here. But you have to understand, Imam Bukhari is laying out his preamble that sets out his vision of what iman is. When I say he's not, when I mean his vision, it means 
what he understands from the Quran and Sunnah in his expert opinion, what Allah and his messenger envisioned and meant in the revelation when we talk about Iman. So it's something grand, it's something vast, it's comprehensive, it's all encompassing. If you're accustomed to your ideas of what Iman, Iman is just beliefs, believing in Allah and the messenger of the last day. Like if that is Iman in your, in your mind, then a lot of these things will not make sense. So you have to do a lot of deconstruction um, because as human beings, we like to compartmentalize things and we like to um, have definitions. We're obsessed with definitions and every definition is fixed. And, um, and then when we see things that, doesn't, that don't correspond with these definitions, sometimes it shakes us and we start asking questions. So, you know, here you see a lot of things happening. There are a lot of discussion about Iman. And the Iman is talking about, you know, their laws, their components, their elements, their physical things, their emotional things mentioned here. There are boundaries, there are limits. It's going up and it's going down, it's fluctuating, it's, it's a dynamic process. So this is very, very important to understand the whole um, conception here. Um, so what is Iman? If we could take a step back and just have now, now that we translated the entire Tarjumatul Bab. So to do a little deconstruction. Um, so a lot of people, so ask this question, like think about it yourself. What is Iman to you? So some of us translate as beliefs. Is it the beliefs themselves? Believing in Allah in the last day, believing in the messenger, believing in the Quran is the last book, believing, and you can add so many beliefs. So where do you get them from? We have a whole tradition called Aqidah in Islam. So there are books of Aqidah, the tenets of belief. So many people confuse Iman with Aqidah. And nothing could be farther apart. Iman is not Aqidah. Aqidah is very different. Aqidah are like external things that you believe in. Iman is a process, a dynamic process within, within you. It's not an external thing. Aqidah is a contextual thing. Aqidah develops when people respond to certain problems in society or respond to deviations in society. So then you, you have to respond, well, we don't believe that, but we're not down with that. We believe in this. This is something we don't do, um, or this is something we don't believe in or affirm. So aqidah are just like the tenets of belief that you affirm. So it's very, very different from this grand notion of Iman in the Quran and Sunnah. So that's one thing you have to get accustomed to uh, deconstructing in your mind. Iman is something amazing. Iman is, you know, the greatest thing in life. Iman is like something that is more powerful than, than, than the mountains. Iman is something that brings down empires. Iman is something that, you know, you can't put your finger on it. It's not something you can exactly define, but it's something incredible. It's something that elevates human beings to Ibrahim Khalilullah because of his Iman. He became the friend of Allah. He became one of the closest people to his Lord. Iman makes someone stand the pressures of society. You have those six or seven youth, Ashab al Kaf, because of their Iman, the whole society wasn't able to sway them. And because of Iman, Ibrahim was thrown in the, the fire and he withstood all the problems and the, in, in the corruptions of his society. That is very different from Aqidah. Aqidah is just a, um, it's basically an expression of the beliefs of a particular group. And the way Aqidah developed in society, um, there was no Aqidah in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu in the time of the companions. When the civil war started happening, and then you had Muslims coming into the deen uh, from different parts of the world, and there were many who were hypocrites. Many of them, they sought to destroy Islam from within. A lot of mass confusion began to arise. And then people began to develop their own paths and not looking at really the way of the Messenger Sallallahu so you had different groups that began to emerge in the Muslim community. And then the early Muslims, what they did, their attitude was always to avoid all of these groups. Anyone who created a group, they would avoid it. Because their, what was their group? Quran and Sunnah. Their group was Allah and His Messenger. And that was how it was for centuries. The early Muslims, that was their approach. But then there was a need at certain points in history where there was so much confusion out there. People were talking about certain notions so much. Um, that there was a need for some of them to clarify 
where you stand on this issue. Is the Quran created? Um, someone who commits a major sin, is he a believer or a disbeliever? They started debating these, 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 these ideas, and there are some individuals that adopted new approaches. An idea came out that, well, if you commit a major sin, you can't have Iman in you, you're a kafir now. Major sin takes you, takes you outside of Islam, um, so you're no longer Muslim. And then the, the idea of the createdness of the Quran. So there was an idea that developed that the Quran is a creation, just like any other creation. It's not part of the essence of Allah. So on all these matters, Muslims, many Muslim scholars were forced to delineate where they stood. So hence, they responded to those circumstances and just by expressing where they stood. And when they expressed these things, or sometimes they wrote about them formally, they became known as aqidah. From in Arabic, a'taqidu means to affirm. So aqidah is a rope. It's, it comes from the word rope. It's something that binds you. So they would express, well, we're not down with that. We don't believe in that. So Abu Hanifa, for instance, when he, and he was very early, he's from you know the late Tabari era, Abu Hanifa came to Mecca to study with Ata ibn Abi Rabah. And when he came to his class, and he's the Mufti of the Haram, great scholar of, of the Haramain, and he was his favorite teacher. You know, Abu Hanifa would say that, you know, that I don't, I've never met a teacher better than Ata ibn Abi Rabah. So Ata is teaching, and when Abu Hanifa comes, he's new, he asks him, where are you from? And he says, from Kufa. And then everybody turned around and looked at him. Because Kufa, what was special about Kufa? What is it about Kufa? Kufa had like a reputation. It was like infamous. Um, that's where all these groups started, right? Like so many, uh, the first sect started in Kufa. Kufa was where Hussein was killed. Um, the, there was political turmoil there. Um, that's where many of the early Muslim groups began, Mu'tazila and the Shia and um they had a different shape and form then but so kufa was a cosmopolitan melting pot with all sorts of crazy ideas so people in medina and mecca some of the more conservative uh, circles they avoided all of that so i i mentioned many many times in um, imam malik's tradition imam malik was from medina he never left he never went to kufa and he always avoided kufa and people coming from outside of mecca and medina like the plague so when Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani came to study with him, they had an interchange. But Muhammad ibn Hassan was a student of Abu Hanifa. So Imam Malik was very suspicious of him. And, um, but then, you know, he also respected him. So he spent three years studying with Imam Malik. And um, Imam Malik learned a lot from him as well. So Imam Malik would always, like, you know, disparage the people of Kufa. But when he saw Muhammad ibn Hassan, he would check himself. And that's, that shows you, you know, like, when Muslims meet each other, like, it kind of moderates everyone. But when you stay in your bubbles and you don't interact, you don't say salam to each other, everyone becomes more and more extreme and strict. Not saying Imam Malik was extreme or strict, but there are ideas he had, misunderstandings of the people of Kufa that Muhammad ibn Hassan corrected. Um, but anyway, Abu Hanifa, coming back to Abu Hanifa, when Ata asked him where you're from Kufa, he said... Oh, so you're from the city of the sects, the city where all sorts of crazy things happen. Abu Hanifa said, yes. So then he asked him, okay, which group are you part of? So Abu Hanifa, you know, he's brilliant. So he said this, and this kind of encapsulates what the early Muslims, their approach to Aqidah was. They never meant to create their own group. They meant to avoid all of the groups. So the early books of Aqidah were not, they didn't even have names. They, they meant to delineate what the, early, the, the Muslims, the mainstream Muslims, they called them Ahl sunnah the people who follow the Sunnah. This is where we stand in avoidance of all of these groups. They never meant to say that this is a group, which is the later development. Well, this is one group among many groups. So there are 73 sects. One is in the Hellfire. Well, one is in Paradise. The rest are in the Hellfire. That's a later idea. But anyway, Abu Hanifa said this. And there was no name for this group. He said, I am from the group that doesn't curse any of the companions and from the group that doesn't, that affirms the Qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal 
and from the group that doesn't believe that sins take you outside of hellfire. So then he, Atta said, okay, you're okay, then sit. And then he sat and studied with him. So this is kind of the approach. That's, that's how Aqidah developed, where you had to express where you stood when things got heated in the community and you wanted to avoid them, but at some point you couldn't. So you would say things like that. And then later Muslim, they would take that and adopt that as a matter of creed or Aqidah, um, which has its place. I'm not downplaying that, but Iman is very different. Iman is not the same thing as Aqidah, so you really have to keep that in mind. Aqidah changes subject to change in circumstances. So you read the earliest book of Aqidah, Aqidah Tahawiyah, for instance, you know, one of the points he mentions is we believe in wiping over our socks. So what does that have to do with Aqidah? What does that have to do with Iman? So, you know, he's just responding to something that was happening in his time. So Aqidah is very contextual. It's responding to certain things. So there are certain groups that didn't believe in that and they made it so prominent that he was forced to express a position on that. But it's not the same thing as Iman. So Iman is not believing in wiping over your socks or these specific tenets. And so Iman is something grand, it's something noble, it's something amazing. It's something that's linked to your mind, it's linked to your heart, it's linked to your actions. And that's what Imam Bukhari is trying uh, his best to express here. So what is Iman? That's like if we can maybe digress a little bit and talk about Iman. Iman is basically using your mind where you know you look at the world and you free your mind from all the influences of culture and tradition. So it's basically link, it's a rational process. It starts as a rational process. It's linked to your mind. It's linked to thinking. It's never sort of following blindly. Iman doesn't come in an inherited way. Aqidah you can inherit. I'm part of this group because that's where I grew up. I'm part of that group because that's where I grew up. And many people are cultural Muslims today because their parents were Muslim, but they never even thought about Iman. Maybe maybe has not entered their hearts. Uh, inshallah, we hope everyone has Iman in their hearts, but there's no guarantee. So on the Day of Judgment, the entry to paradise will be on Iman and not your group affiliation. It's not what religion you were born in. Because Iman is not inherited, as you can see from the story of Nuh and his son. And you can see from many of the companions, their parents were mushrikeen, and, many, and, and their children were not. Or some children were mushrikeen, the parents were not. So Iman is something where you look at the world and like, like the process of Iman of Ibrahim is very instructive in the Quran. You examine the world, you look at you know, where the source of power and life is, and you realize you come to this realization that the world is operating under a creator or a sustainer that's, you know, everything is operating under the command of Allah and not anything else. So when you realize that, and that's, that's a, where the process of Iman begins, like Ibrahim, when he was looking, searching for his Lord, he saw the stars and he said, this is the greatest thing I can see right now. But when he saw the stars went away, he said, no, that can't be my Lord. So that was a rational process because his heart was pure, his fitra was pure, but he was he was able to think clearly. Then the sun, then the moon came, and then the sun came, and the sun is the greatest thing. Like in creation, there's nothing greater you see with your eyes than the sun. You know, like the sun comes out, everything changes in the world. It goes away, everything changes. But then when he saw the sun set, he said, "La uhibbul afilin." He says something amazing. I cannot put my trust, my 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 love, my heart cannot rest in those things that go away because you realize looking at the world that the lord of the world will always be someone that's there not someone that goes away not something that goes away so this process of iman starts with clear understanding and once you realize all of that that's rububiya then it comes to uluhiya then you realize okay the same lord that created the world created the system put the system in place you know then he has commands He's the only one that deserves us to follow him, to obey him, to love him, to worship him. That's the natural next step. And then once then you realize that you have to worship, then you move on to uluhiya. And then your iman continues to increase. So it's not like a single check, yes or no. It's a process that starts rationally. So iman, if we can summarize, iman is initially a rational process. It's three parts. Number one, you recognize that since Allah is the creator and sustainer, 
now you recognize your duty to love him and obey him and worship him and not anyone else. That's the first step. The second step is once you realize that, that he's a creator and the sustainer, then you realize then he has not left his world alone. He must have guided us. Then you're, you realize that he must have sent messengers. Then you come to, so the first is Iman Billah. The second step is Iman Bil Rusul. You realize that this creator who put this world in place, now there must be like, you know, he, he promised to guide us. He put, you know, he, he runs this world. There must be a system of guidance. He must have chose people to communicate to us because of his nature, who he is. So Iman Bil Rusul. And finally, the third step in Iman is you realize, well, you know, this world does not make sense in light of him being the creator, the sustainer, all loving and merciful. This world never makes sense on its own, uh, except if there's an afterlife. That's Iman bil Akhirah. So these are the three basic components of Iman. You know, believing in Allah, uh, well, believing what you owe Allah, uluhiyah, so Tawheed, number two, Risala, Number three, Akhirah. These are the three major themes in the Quran. That's what Iman is about. Tawheed, Risala, and Akhirah. Um, so Mawla Maududi writes about that in his the female Quran. That these are these, you know, to understand the Quran, people say that, well, it's disjointed, things don't make sense. But he says, he writes in an introduction that if you keep this in mind, the whole theme of the Quran is just three things: Tawheed, Risala, and Akhirah. Everything in the Quran is about that, then it makes perfect sense. So this is the rational process that, you know, you notice that in this Iman rational process, there's very little discussion of um, the existence of God. So that's something silly. That's something doesn't even need Iman. That's something that's ingrained in you. Only fools discuss whether God exists or not. So the first step is not even that God exists. And even the Quran, the first thing Allah says in the Quran is, um, you know, Hudan Lil Muttaqeen. It is guidance for the people of Taqwa. And about Allah, Alhamdulillah. The first thing in the Quran is Hamd. All praise belongs to the creator of the heavens and the earth. The first thing Allah doesn't say in the Quran that I exist or there is a God. Because that's something ingrained in your nature, in your soul. You don't need to discuss that. So the very starting point of Iman, that's already there. Starting point of Iman is, okay, now that since Allah created us, since he sustains us, since he's behind everything, then no one else deserves our worship, our obedience, our love. That's uluhiyah. And so if you, if you don't have any of these steps out of these three, then you cannot have Iman. So Iman is, is these are the three basic fundamentals of Iman. And that Iman is not just an affirmation, you can notice here. It's not just something you say with your tongue. You can get many people to say words with their tongue. If you go on these street dawah campaigns, some, some of them, they just like trick people into saying stuff. I'm not saying all of them do that, but some of them do that. Is that Iman? Like you just talk to someone and he just likes the way you talk and you trick them and say, okay, say the words of Shahada. Like, you know, you could say the words of Shahada and Iman could, might not be in your heart. Right? So that's, that's a very likely possibility. So Iman is that rational process that makes you come to this firm realization and inspires you to move on to worship. And, then, and it's something, it's not one thing. It's something that takes a lifetime to build. It goes up and down. It, it, it needs to be nurtured. And it's kind of like, you know, it's something that has to come from within. It cannot come from without. It cannot come from a book of Aqidah. It cannot come from these are the things you need to believe in. It has to come from within. So that's very different from the way we approach Iman. And it's like, it's Iman or Ibadah is a need inside of us more important than the need for food and drink. So, you know, we don't realize that because our souls are corrupted. Our fitra, that nature that Allah created us with, it has been corrupted by us, by our environment. But once you like decorrupt that, deconstruct that, then you realize that, you know, Iman is something ingrained within us. And that's the only natural process. That's why so many people come to faith in different ways. There's no single path for people of Iman. It's not from one book or one person or reading this or reading that, because it's, it's ingrained in us. So that leads us to, so Iman leads you to worship. That's the second thing here when you talk about, like worship is part of Iman. That's the point he's trying to make here. 
that so many of us we think oh iman is just a belief and now islam is a worship and now that's the second step no it is all iman all of it is iman iman is um you know iman is what inspires you and takes that uluhiya means he's worthy of worship what's the point of that basic belief that allah has the right to be worshiped if you don't worship him if you affirm that Allah has the right to be worshipped and you don't worship him, you're not really affirming it. It hasn't really settled in your heart. So, Iman, like, if you have Iman, you will have worship. You will have deeds. If you don't have deeds, you don't have worship, then you don't really have Iman. So that's the whole point here. So Iman leads you to worship. Can there be Iman without Amal? Impossible. This notion came into religion much later from people of philosophy and kalam and that iman is just an affirmation then the amal is separate. But if you read the Quran and you read the sunnah, you will never find such a distinction. Everything is linked. Iman is amal. There is no iman without amal. It is pure stupidity to think that there could be iman without amal and amal is separate. When you read Quran and sunnah, and that's why this long preamble, everything has to do with action. Everything has to do with Amal. So what do we need to do? First, we need to, like, what's the process of faith? We resurrect and affirm our fitra. Then we use our reason and mind um, to come to this point of Iman. And that Iman takes you immediately to the point of worship. And that worship, and it feeds back into Iman. When you worship, you increase in Iman. It's not just a rational thing anymore, but now when you're actually worshiping, you're making salah, your iman goes up. You recite Quran, your iman goes up. All of us feel that in Ramadan. In Ramadan, certain seasons, your iman goes up. And sometimes it goes down based on factors. So iman is a complex phenomenon. It's something deep, it's something powerful, it's something amazing. And this is something that Imam Bukhari is spending quite some time laying down that foundation before he gives you that hadith. So this is very, very important. So what does he say? First he says, um, after he mentions the title, wa qawlun wa fi'lun wa yazidu wa yankus. So the first thing he says about Iman after the title um, is that it is qawl, statement, and fi'lun, action. So Iman is qawl and Iman is action. Um, so what does that mean? So it doesn't necessarily mean that um, just the words are your iman. That's not what it means. Some people think the shahada, saying the shahada, that is iman. You can say the shahada without believing in it. It's not about words. The computer can say the shahada. Now you have AI and all these voice things. Like you can, you can take anybody's uh, picture. Uh, and his voice and reconstruct a speech. Suppose you take someone and you just create a shahada video. Like, does is that iman? No, because it's not about the words. But what it means here is, qawl here means, um, qawl is like a declaration in the Quran. That's kind of misunderstood. You know, like the Quran, how many times the Quran says qul? So many verses have qul. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Qul ya yuhal kafirun. So say, you know, but what does that mean? Does it mean say with your mouth? No. So it's like when, when in fiqh, like when you say, wa huwa qawlu Ahmad, wa huwa qawlun, qawlu shafiri. It is a statement of Ahmad. It's a, it means the view. It means the view of Ahmad. So qawl doesn't necessarily mean words. Qawl means like a declaration. And it doesn't necessarily have to do words, but generally it's with words. But here, iman qawlun means that, you know, if you have, if you, if you come to that iman with your heart, um, in your mind, the qawl comes next. Qawl is the declaration. So if you come to that belief, qawl has to be there. So if you have iman, there's so many people in the world that, you know, you talk to them about the creator, they're like, okay, that makes sense. I could be down with that. But they'll never say the shahada. Is that iman? No. Because iman is complex. It has to continue. If you really believe that, if you, if you really believe that you know, Allah is the creator, and the only creator, and the sustainer, and the master responsible for everything. And you believe that he's the only one that should be worshipped and, you know, obeyed and no one else. Then you have to have come to the qawl, which is a declaration of your faith. That's what shahada is. But that, that's not necessarily words. 
So uh, Shea Hakan makes a brilliant point about language here. He says people misunderstand the function of language. Most people think language, its function is only about communication. But language has two functions, not just communication. Communication is a second function of language, to impart an idea to someone else. But the first function of language is that it organizes your thoughts properly and clearly. So when you say, when the verse says that, it doesn't mean someone standing up saying, I am from the Muslims. It just means in your heart of hearts, in your mind, you have actually articulated that I am from the believers. So that's what qawl is, that's what language is. So language, and that's why the, the power of the shahada, you have to take the shahada because once you come to all of these realizations of iman, now you have to articulate it. Once you articulate it, 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 it reinforces the notion in your mind. So, so you know, language and qawl reinforces and organizes your thoughts properly. And then secondly, it's used to communicate to others. That's why, you know, like a lot of people have ideas, right? Um, you have ideas about different things, but unless you put it on paper, unless you write an article for a blog, or you write a book, or you write, some, or you deliver a lecture, those ideas stay here, but they're not articulated. Why? Because you need to articulate them in your mind. Once you start saying the words in your mind, then it starts making more sense. You organize your thinking. It organizes your thinking more clearly. So that's what goal here is, that you have to organize your thinking on Iman. And then you have to express it in the Shahada. Also, there's language. But the language starts from within, and then it comes out. And that's the two dual function of language that people misunderstand. This is based on Ibn Taymiyyah's brilliant insights on language. Um, you have a question? Comment? Take the mic, yeah. We spoke about the... Yeah, go on. Yeah, so we spoke about the books of Aqidah. So, so the, let's say the other school you mentioned, the Kalams, I didn't mention. You no mentioned. <laughs> So how do they, they teach this book, obviously, and then the, for them, the, if you open their books of Aqidah, they always tell you Al-Iman huwa Al-Qawl, and they stop there. Let's say somebody from a different school, they will say Qawlun wa Fi'lun wa Amr al-Jawarih, and they'll expand Wabuhu fi Qalbihi wa Lisanihi. So they expand, let's say, the expression that's made by Imam Bukhari. Mm -hmm. So if they read this chapter, how do they understand it? Because in their books of Aqidah, they obviously in their Madaris, they teach these very books. How, because this is, he's an accepted scholar. I'm just trying to understand how. Is that on? You can turn it on. I can turn it on? No, I'm talking about the mic. He's getting hot. Oh. The AC, not the mic. So okay. That's Sorry. why I'm just trying to. I mean, I, without any doubt, all books of Aqidah, like either it be Kitab al Tawheed mm. or the Old of Aqidah, they came out of situations, like you mentioned, wiping all the socks because mm. they know the people of Bid'ah, mm -hmm. they didn't do these certain things. But, like, and even the people of Kalam, they came out of the Mu'tazila. So, all of, yes, mm. but how do they still understand Imam Bukhari was a well respected scholar itself? Like, so I'm I mean, it's a good question, but the question is not how do they understand Imam Bukhari. The question is how do they understand these verses? Because Bukhari is just spelling out Qawl, but the, like how many verses are here? So how do you understand that? Um, so that's a tough question. So, you know, the answer to that, you look up any commentary in Sahih Bukhari or reflect your, your background and your views on Iman. So, you know, like Ibn Hajar um, mentioned there are three views here, there are three ways what is different between Iman and Islam and things like that. So um, everyone has an answer at the end of the day. But what Imam Bukhari's brilliance, what I think he, he's doing, he's letting the verses speak and the messenger speak for you. And he's giving brief like allusions of what it means. Instead of giving you a book and explanation exactly what it is, A to Z, but let the Quran speak for itself. So he's quoting verse after if you read all these verses, there should be no doubt in anyone's mind. Yes, dadu iman imanihim. Like iman does increase, iman does decrease. So the counter for some of the people who believe that iman is just a stable thing is well, they'll say that's haqiqatul iman, and that's the, the basic iman. So they'll divide it into um, basic versus like advanced iman. Or, and some people talk about quantity versus quality. So there's one idea that. Um, these, so the people who don't accept that, they say, well, this is talking about the quality of the iman, but not the quantity. The quantity is the same. But uh, 
Jay Akram says that's a horrible idea. He said that makes no sense because the quality and the quantity both increase. Because when you pray, your iman increases and you believe in more things. So someone who believes in Allah, right? Like your iman has a certain quantity. Then the more you read the verses of the Quran, you learn about the malaika, you learn about Jannah, you learn about hellfire, all these details. And they, your iman actually, the quantity increases as well. So there's a loop cycle with worship. It goes back to both quantity and quality. So the truth is that everything increases. Um, and there's no such thing as just a static element here. Um, you know, but it's something, you know, like a lot of the people of Kalam, they say Iman is a list of 10 things, right? Um, and someone who believes in those 10 things, you're there. But now you could be like up here, but you're still a believer. But that's debatable. If you believe in those 10 things or you believe in certain tenets and it doesn't inspire you to action, is that really Iman? Because there's a link between like, uh, so one of the, so one analogy Shah Hakam uses is like, well, it's like medicine. It's like, let's take the uh, parable of honey. You believe that honey is cure, right? Like, because you read about it and people told you about it. Now you have a belief that honey cures certain things. Now you get sick, right? You have a sore throat or you got COVID or whatever, and then use honey and you got cured the next day. Now, what does that do to your belief? Is it the same? It increased. Because now, so you can't say, well, I didn't believe before, I believe now. You did believe before that honey is, has curative properties, but now your belief gets reinforced. So it actually increases. So there's so many things like that, you know, like, uh, like dua, or even a spiritual thing like dua. You believe that if I raise my hands, I call on Allah, he's going to listen. Allah does listen because you, you read the Quran, you believe the Quran. So you have that belief. But suppose a person has that belief, right? And then he has experience in his life. Every time he asks Allah for something, he got it. So what does that do to his belief that Allah hears all du'as? It is much deeper. It's more profound. And the quantity and the quality is increasing. So that's what Iman is here. Everything is linked. Like everything definitely increases. So... So Iman is definitely not a list of things you believe in. That's what Aqidah tells you. But Aqidah has a role to tell you like what the right beliefs are or not. But Iman is coming to those beliefs. And the basic beliefs are Tawheed, Risala, and Akhirah. Everything else is just an explanation of that. Or um, So that's really, you know, you have to distinguish Iman and Aqidah. Aqidah does not find its place in the Quran or in the Sunnah much. But it was a need at a, at a certain point in time, and then it became a hindrance. So much of Aqidah can be like, you know, uh, discarded today, I believe. Because, uh, you know, an average Muslim that believes in Iman, that believes in Allah, that's what you need to teach them, not the intricates of, can Allah create another world with Muhammad in it? That was like a raging debate in India 100 years ago. Um, can there be other u parallel universes with another Nabi? Um, can there be more than one Jibreel? Can Allah lie? All these like philosophical debates. Um, so they did occur and they still continue to occur. But what does that like do to an individual person? Like, and the main thing is the Quran. The Quran is your source of guidance. If the Quran is silent about that, remember you mentioned in the previous class today that the Quran is a complete book. What does that mean? That means whatever the Quran included is never equal to that which it excluded. Whatever you excluded from the Quran, it cannot be as important as what's in the Quran. So what's in the Quran is of primary importance. When you read the Quran, what do you find? Tawheed, rububiyah, uluhiyah, worship. You find, uh, you know, avoiding shirk. So like shirk is the most important thing to avoid. And the pages of the Quran are filled with the warnings against shirk. So shirk can never be exaggerated. There are people say, oh, you know, there's an obsession with Muslims of shirk. There's an obsession of the Quran with shirk. And Tawheed. Tawheed and Shirk is a central Quranic idea. Tawheed and Shirk. So we need to come back to the Quran and, and use that as a guide. With that in mind, like to teach Iman, what's the best way to teach Iman for children? It's not a book of Aqidah. For children, it would be like Hadith Jibreel. It would be basic stories of the Prophet, basic verses of the Quran. Um, and there are many great scholars that are doing that. They're modifying these books. They're not teaching Aqidah. There's a place for Aqidah to understand 
the philosophical and, and intellectual debates. Um, so, but let's, you know, these questions are going to be answered in this whole chapter, all these questions. So let's continue reading so we can uh, hear the answers from um, the great individual Imam Bukhari is quoting. So these verses are self-explanatory. Like I said, please read them at your own uh, disposal uh, on your own time. Then he says, And so hating for the sake of Allah and loving for the sake of Allah is part of Iman. Okay, So that is uh, an emotional element. So it's mentioning here that you know, this is an emotional element that um, these things actually affect your Iman. They increase your iman. They're part of iman, but they increase your iman. When you see things that Allah hates, and people that do things that Allah hates, you have this natural hatred for that. And then the more you read of the Quran, and you it reinforces that in your iman, actually increases. Um, and then, what's next? وَكَتَبَ عُمَرِ بْنَ عَبْدِ الْعَزِيزِ إِلَىٰ عَدِي بْنَ عَدِي So Umar wrote a letter one of his governors, and one of the portion of the letter says, Inna lil iman, verily iman is, has many things, many elements. Fara'id, those obligatory matters, things that you have to do. And then um, shara'ir, laws, sharia. Um, there's also things you have to do, but it's like a different connotation. Um, where, I've lost my place. Wahududan, limits. There are things you can't go beyond. So that's part of Iman as well. Was Sunanan. Sunanan are the acts of worship, the practices that you have to do. Those are all part of Iman. And he says, فَمَنِ اسْتَكْمَلَهَا اسْتَكْمَلَ iman. Those who do all of them, they have perfected their Iman. But if you miss some of them, your Iman is deficient, but it's still there. So again, this idea of Iman is a structure. It could be more complete or less complete. It could be higher, it could be lower. To be greater in quantity, lesser in quantity. And then he says at the end, in Aish, lakum. If I were if I have time, he's meaning to he's a he's a he's a Khalifa. If I have time one day I'll explain to you so you can the details of this so you can live by them. But if Allah calls me back, then I'd rather be with Allah, and not you. That's what that really means. It's a it's an interesting expression. It says, Wa ana I am not keen to be in your company. If I die, I'm not keen to be in your company. So what does that mean? It means that people of Iman, people who have real Iman, and, and tawakkul and trust in Allah, you know, for them, death is something really amazing. It's not something that they fear or hate. There's nothing more amazing for them than to be with Allah when it's their time. So he said, if Allah calls me for my time, I'd rather be with him then I am ready. So that's what Iman does to people. So like, it's amazing. It's actually a very profound thing. Um, people of Iman don't want to live forever. Ever. People with a lack of Iman want to live forever. Lo yu'ammaru alfa sanatin. You know, Allah speaks about the people with weak faith, Bani Israel. One of the qualities, characteristics, they wish that they would be given a thousand years. They're so clinging to life. But believers, they realize that, look, this world is just a manifestation of you know, what Allah created. And when you die, you just pass to another realm. It's not that, you know, and that's a better realm to be in if you had Iman. So for, for believers, death is not so uh, negative and it's something that's amazing. There's a hadith to that effect. No. No, so, okay. So these good, uh, so tying this to the previous seminar, these are the mu'allaqat. So when, when someone, <clears throat> when, when you quote a hadith without a chain, it's called mu'allaq because it's hanging. You didn't quote your teacher. That's what Bukhari is doing here. So mu'allaqat, the whole discussion about mu'allaqat, these are it. So this first mu'allaq is Kataba uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. So it's a mu'allaq report. So these mu'allaq reports, we talked about them at length, what do they mean? Um, so some of them are not prophetic, so you won't put them in the primary corpus, and others might have chains of isnad. They all have isnad, but the isnads might be not on his conditions, 
or they might be on his conditions, but he's not, right now he's teaching you fiqh and not hadith. So the chapter headings, he's teaching you fiqh. So he's not that keen uh, to give you isnads here. So generally he doesn't give you isnad. Okay, what does it say? Read it. Okay. Yeah, so all of these, like, so, so Abdul Aziz, Umar bin Abdul Aziz's letter is from the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, Musannaf ibn Abi Shayba, and Bayhaqi. And the rest, all of them are like in different books as well. So this, the later people, they, so these books existed after Bukhari, right? So Bukhari would not be quoting those books. He would have the original Isnad. But all the Isnads for these can be found in the following books. So the, when you read any book of Hadith, I think in this, do they have it here? In this particular book of Hadith manuscript? Yeah, so in the footnotes, it'll tell you where this Hadith finds. You can find this Hadith. Yeah, so that would be the judgment of the particular person who wrote the book or the muhaqqiq, which you can take with a grain of salt. So that's why a good manuscript is important. You can have references. If you want to trace this hadith, this because Bukhari is quoting only portions. Like the verses of the Quran, you should read the original. If any quote, Mu'allak report intrigues you, look it up in the original, you'll find more context. Well, Bukhari can't put that here. That's not his purpose here. Um, if his purpose was just to teach you these reports, then he would. But his purpose is to get to the hadith. We didn't get to the hadith yet, the main hadith. Wallahu a'lam. What time is it? 9.34. Yeah. Five years worth of work? Yeah. Yeah. I had to go compile those stuff on my own. It would probably be a lifetime. Lifetime yeah, no, of learning to, about Iman. Yeah. Just, no, but just to compile and say, okay, this is what Masood said. This is what Abdul Aziz said. To pick out all those things, you know, like how long, like how is he doing this? Not how well, remember his this. mind, like he had That's... everything at his mind, everything at his fingertip. He was like, he could, it was like he's reading them actually at the moment. They're all in front of him at the same time. Like if we so, sat down and wanted to go back through all these, it would take us a few weeks. Yeah. Just for the intro. Allah. Absolutely right. Allah. So should we continue or... Ah, what you say? <laughs> okay. Okay, so we didn't do one hadith today. No, not the first day. First day I wanted to do one, but I wanted to do five. Okay, you know what? Let me finish quickly. I'll be more brief. It's just how we're halfway through. Waqala Mu'ad. Mu'adh ibn Jabal said, Ijlis bina nu'minu sa'a. Ijlis bina nu'minu sa'a. So Mu'adh ibn Jabal, he said to his companion, look, let's sit and believe for a moment. That's what it literally means. But what does it mean? It means revive your iman. Revive your iman. So get close and turn it on. It'll be, and sit right here, right under it. Which one? No, we we're here, right? Oh, oh, Waqala Ibrahim. Okay, Waqala Ibrahim, I skipped. Waqala Ibrahim, ولكن ليطمع إن قلبي. Ibrahim, this is a story where Ibrahim, uh, Allah asked him. Ibrahim asked, "How do you raise the dead?" Allah asked him, "Awa lam tu'min? Do you not have iman?" He said, "Qala wa bala, ولكن ليطمع إن قلبي." Of course, but I want my heart to be more settled and more firm. Um, so that this proves that you know. Iman is not just a static thing, but like the more you see things, the more you see the signs of Allah, the more your Iman will go up. And that happened for Ibrahim. He definitely was a believer. He had no doubt that Allah could raise the dead, but he just wanted to these the signs of when you see great signs of Allah, when you see ground mountain ranges and nature and something that amazes you, you say, subhanAllah, your Iman actually goes up because you know uh, Allah is the creator of all of that. And then Waqala Mu'ad, Mu'ad said, let's sit and revive our Iman for a moment, for a sa'a, a period of time. So this shows you the attitude of the believers. You're always keen to increase your Iman. It's like, you know, everyone knows in their family or friends, there's, there's always that one health conscious freak, right? Everything that he eats, like he looks up the calories, he looks up everything and like 
he only has protein for certain companies and this and that. So there are certain people like that because they're, they're so much into their health that they're watching everything that they contributing to their health. And they're avoiding things that might not be okay, but they're just like, you know, they want to avoid it. That's what Iman is for the believer. Believers want to nurture their Iman. They want to get involved in those majalis, those sittings where their Iman increases. Mu'adh, he would say that to his companion, let's sit, revive our Iman. They were probably reciting Quran or discussing matters of Quran and Sunnah. That's what increases your Iman. وَقَالَ ibn Mas'ud الْيَقِينُ الْإِيمَانُ كُلُّهُ Ibn Mas'ud, he said, um, الْيَقِينُ, this conviction, this certainty, is all of Iman. And this is Hakim and Tabarani. The previous one of Mu'adh was in Musnad Ahmad, Musannaf ibn Abi Shayba, and, Be- and Bayhaqi. So, um, Ibn Mas'ud, so what is this Bukhari's teaching here is that Yaqeen is linked to Iman. How? Because Iman starts, you might not have Yaqeen in the beginning. You come to that rational realization, you believe in Allah, you might still have some doubts. But as your Iman grows, your doubts go away, your Yaqeen becomes fir- fir- uh, firmer and firmer. So the end stage of Iman, the natural end result of Iman is complete Yaqeen and Tawakkul. Yaqeen, full trust in Allah, Tawakkul, and Yaqeen, certainty in Allah. It's not something you achieve overnight, but it's the end result of Iman. That's what this means. Al-Yaqeenu, al-Imanu kullu. Yaqeen is complete Iman. When you don't have Yaqeen, you still have Iman, but it might not be fully complete. So um, that's what he's saying here. Um, there's a hadith Ibn Hajar quotes in his commentary from Tabarani that Ibn Hajar deems sound. So it's uh, you can take it with a grain of salt. It's a lesser tier sahih. لو أن اليقين وقع في القلب كما ينبغي لطار اشتياقا إلى الجنة وهربا من النار. If yaqeen were to settle in the heart the way it should, then the hearts will yearn for paradise and run away from the hellfire, flee anything that leads to the hellfire. So this is about certainty, yaqeen. So yaqeen is something amazing. Finally, وقال ابن عمر ابن عمر says لا يبلغ العبد حقيقة التقوى that the servant does not attain the reality of taqwa until he leaves what wavers in his heart. So taqwa here is part of iman as well. Taqwa is part of iman and Islam both. Um, so taqwa is, you know, that that state uh, of fear of Allah that guides your actions. So you know everything is linked to iman, but like. You know, taqwa is part of like part of amal, and amal is part of iman. So, taqwa is where, you know, you actually that fear of Allah influences your decisions. It helps you in your obedience. When taqwa comes, it purifies your heart, pushes you to your obedience. Obedience raises your iman. So that's why taqwa is very very important. He, Imam Bukhari quotes an author about taqwa that the reality of taqwa is where anything that wavers in your heart, your pure heart, you leave it. Something you're not so certain about, you're not so sure about, you leave it. There's a hadith of the Arba'in that had to do with that as well. Yes, Ibrahim, you had a question? Like when I was studying here, man, either people believe in Islam or they don't. Now, he could have, he, he, could, he can't be tough for what he comes with, but so even like early Islam, he believed, believed that the Quran was true. Or you could have the Iman, I guess, in the most initial stages, either you have that Iman or you don't have anything. Because without that basic, you believe in Allah, you believe in the basics of Islam, and that Muhammad was true, or you don't believe, you don't have Iman. And that's the same today. So we might go out and go and meet Christian people and say, you tell all the people who came by the side and say, yeah, that's great, but I don't believe none of it. But he doesn't have anything. So my question is, this iman is a mystery that somehow either it's in your heart, it could be it could be shallow, it could be deep. But either you have it, like for example, man, I I said so far I went to the gentleman with me, he said, What do you do for your house? I said, I do nothing, but I love you and I love Islam. He said, Well, you do your best for So that that you see my point. So iman is something else. It's kind of either you got it 
a result. Then you can increase what you can do and you can do all, this, all the other things. But if you don't have that to match, of course, yeah. So that's a good point. Um, so I maybe I didn't mean to say in <clears throat> Bukhari, this certainly doesn't mean to say that Iman is something always fluctuating. I mean, it is fluctuating, but it is there's an entry point. That's what the brother is trying to say. There is an entry point. So you either have Iman or you don't have Iman. When you don't have Iman, you're Kafir. When you have Iman, you're Mu'min. But then Iman is huge after that. So that entry point is very important. Of course, you have to. There has to be a point where uh, you you're a believer. You Mu'min. Um, you we believe in Allah. Yeah, but the thing is, like with non-Muslims and Muslims, like those are what we see externally. That's how we judge. We don't see inside people's hearts. So there could be, and there there are many Muslims that, or people we think they're Muslim, but they're really not. Um, that 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 certainly is the case. Um, I mean, there are agents in the communities that pretend to be Muslim and they're recording our khatibs and all sorts of stuff. So it's easy to feign iman, right? Uh, why don't you turn that on so because the online people did not hear you someone turned the microphone on for him yeah well do the, say that in the mic say it in the mic yeah go ahead brother i just Mom said Burhan. i had no idea i was going to be a muslim on allah allahu akbar allahu akbar allahu akbar, allahu akbar. <laughs> yeah so iman is amazing man like aqidah is not amazing that's the thing like aqidah just divides you and makes you think negative but iman is so amazing we need to bring our focus back to iman and not aqidah iman is something incredible it's just there's no single path to it you can't explain it in a lot of cases it just it's just something so incredible and amazing when you have it when you taste it you know it but if you don't taste it and then you don't have it, it's hard to talk about. You can't really define it and, you know, yeah. I, I said to my, my, one of my friends, he said, he said to me, granddad, yeah. I didn't have a choice in being a Muslim. Uh -huh. I said, Allah chose you. Not Allah, yes. Because, you know, as, 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 as Muslim, my, I'm we're, what's third, fourth generation Muslim, right? So, but I'm just saying that to say, that our children who are Muslims, sometimes they say, I didn't, have, I didn't, you know, I didn't choose to be a Muslim. Why, why am I a Muslim? And I said that Allah chose you to be a Muslim. So this is, I kind of get the, uh, what you're saying is, is that some of us, you know, we, uh, we, the faith automatically comes to us from a, from a, from a world that we don't know, mm -hmm. from a world that we really don't know. Maybe automatic is not the right word because it still is an active process, right? Even when you're born Muslim, we grow up, we're nurtured into Iman, but there's still a point where you make a decision to believe. Like if that's not there, it cannot be Iman. Iman has to come from your mind. There's, we all grow up praying, but there's some moment in your life where it becomes conscious. We start, you know, you know, and it could be, it's, it could be like the back door. Like, like a lot of people come to Islam through other groups that may not be Muslim, but like, you know, and also many of us are born Muslim and we never think about it. We just go to the masjid because everyone's doing it and we grow up and we read those books. And but there always has to be some moment in your life where you 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 make that choice. And and even if it doesn't have to be, well, am I going to be Muslim or not? It could just be when you're coming to Salah, when you say Allahu Akbar, that's a choice. When you choose yourself and no one's forcing you come to the masjid saying Allahu Akbar, that is a choice. And in the Salah, you're saying all those affirmations, Allahu Akbar, an la ilaha illallah, and the Shahada. That's why, that's the beauty of Islam, there's Shahada in every page of the Quran, in every act of worship, in every rakah of Salah. You're, it's kind of like the Shahada. You're saying it all the time, reminding us of what Allah is intending to do, trying to remind us that, look, um, it has to be conscious. At some point, you have to make it conscious um, and not automatic. And, Nothing's worse for worship and iman than automatic stuff. And in salah is the worst enemy of salah, being automatic and not thinking about it, just letting your mind wander. Everything has to be purposeful at every moment of your life. So 
And then finally, the, the last two things are qala mujahid, as I mentioned, when he say, when he see qala mujahid, Sufyan authority said, fahasbuka bihi, and mujahid said in this verse, this verse is, shara'a lakum min ad ma wassa bihi nuhan. So this verse is a great verse uh, where, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we have ordained for you, um, I'm trying to pull up the verse, um, bismillah. شَرَعَ لَكُمْ مِنَ الدِّينِ مَا وَصَّى بِهِ نُوحًا وَالَّذِينَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ وَمَا وَصَّيْنَا بِهِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَمُوسَى وَعِيسَى أَنْ أَقِيمُ الدِّينِ وَلَا تَتَفَرَّقُوا فِيهِ We have ordained for you um, the same religion we ordained, ordained or enjoined upon Nuh and what we... Okay, he has prescribed for you the religion which he prescribed for Nuh and which we revealed to you, O Muhammad, and which we enjoin upon Ibrahim and Musa and Isa with this command, Aqimuddin, establish this deen and do not split up regarding it. Iqamatuddin, Aqimuddin. This is a central mission of the prophets and the mission of all of us to establish the deen on the face of this earth. So Mujahid says about this verse, Shara'a lakum means awsaynaka ya Muhammad wa iya. It means we advise you. Just It's just a commentary what Shara'a means. We advise you to follow this way, which is the same way that um, Deen and Wahida, one same way. And then Ibn Abbas says about the verse Shira'atan wa Minhaja, the larger verse is in Surat al Ma'ida, verse 48, where Allah says, Wa anzalna ilayka al kitaba bil haqqi musaddiqan lima bayna yadayhi min al kitabi wa muhayminan alayhi. Fahkum baynahum bima anzal Allah, wa la tattabi ahwa'ahum amma ja'aka min al haqq. So the verse is speaking, we have revealed the book to you, O Muhammad, with the truth, confirming what the books were revealed before, the Torah and the Injil, and protecting them and guarding them over them. So judge in the affairs of men accordance with the law that Allah revealed. Do not follow their desires in regards to the truth that has come to you. For each of you we have made we have appointed a law and a way of life. Shira'atan wa minhaja. Context here is the, the Bani Israel, the previous nations, and the Muslims. Each of you, we had enjoined a law and a way of life. Shira'atan wa minhaja. And Ibn Abbas says Shira'atan means a path. Sunnatan means a tradition. They're kind of like synonyms. Sabil and Sunnah is very similar. So each of you, we gave you a path to follow like prophets and specifics of, of the deen that might have been different, but it's very similar. It's just, so this is the last author he quotes. And then he says, Bab dua'ukum imanukum. So here, Bab means chapter, and dua'ukum imanukum, which means your dua is your iman, which means that dua is synonymous with iman. So this is a mistake here. So you can see in your books, do you have Bab or not? Some manuscripts have it, some don't have it. So this is like problematic because like it doesn't make sense to have a new chapter here. Um, Imam Nawawi says about this, غلط فاحش, that this is a major mistake, an open mistake. Um, because then there's a hadith here. The hadith is about the five pillars. Bunya al-Islam ala khams. What's the title of the chapter? Bunya al-Islam ala khams. So this hadith obviously belongs in that chapter. So having a new chapter here doesn't make sense. So some of the manuscripts have Bab Dua'ukum Imanukum is a new chapter, and that title doesn't even make sense here. How does that title fit in with that hadith? Yes. Yeah, but Dua'ukum Imanukum, how does that fit with Bunyal Islam wa ala khams? Shahadat on la ilaha illallah, the Muhammad Rasul wa qam is salah wa itai zaka wa hajjil wa hajj wa sawmi ramadan. The five pillars of Islam. How does the chapter heading dua ukum imanukum? Your dua is your iman fit here? Because uh, so dua ukum imanukum, when you look up the Athar, it's a statement of Ibn Abbas. So it's a continuation of Ibn Abbas's commentary, Shiratan wa Minhaja. So that's what most scholars say, and that makes more sense. Then the hadith belongs in the chapter, and this is the only hadith of the chapter, and then you have the next chapter. Okay. But yeah. if, you, if you call on something, if you're calling on someone other than Allah, then your iman is trash. It's it, 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 you have no iman. No. Yeah. It makes sense. It fits in this chapter. But I'm saying, 
this being a new chapter, and that next hadith doesn't fit here. We haven't read the hadith yet. So this makes perfect sense because du'a is part of iman. So there's, and in some manuscripts, they, some versions of Sahih Bukhari, they have, they quote the verse there. And what is the verse? قُلْ مَا يَعْبَعُ بِكُمْ رَبِّي لَوْلَا دُعَاءُكُمْ فَقَدْ كَذَّبَتُمْ فَسَوْفَ يَكُونُ لِزَامًا The last verse of Surah Al-Furqan. Which means, say unto the, the believers, no weight or value would my sustainer attach to you were it not for your faith in him. لَوْلَا دُعَاءُكُمْ So the meaning of du'a here is iman. That's the meaning of du'a. So even du'a is, is related to iman. So it makes sense, fits in the chapter. But this bab, the statement bab, um, doesn't make a lot of sense here. Uh, Ibn Hajar has an explanation. He says, yeah, some people say it doesn't make sense. But then, if it does make sense, this is what it could possibly mean, which is kind of like uh, stretching it. But most nuskhas or many nuskhas don't have bab in their version. So it would be interesting to see those of you who have Sahih Bukhari, do you have bab or not? I don't see a lot of people with their original books yet, here yet. Yeah, yeah. But even that generality, I think, it, did, it doesn't make sense here. That's what, um, I mean, m maybe it can make sense to others, but now we say it makes no sense. How the galat fahish is an open mistake. Shay Akram has the same view that the, the right versions don't have Bab there because it's a continuation of Ibn Abbas's previous statement, the author of Ibn Abbas. And then I'll end with Haddathana. Ubaidullah ibn Musa. So this is the teacher of Bukhari. Now this is the main text. This is the first hadith you're getting. And it's from Ubaidullah ibn Musa. Who is Ubaidullah ibn Musa? We did cover him last. You want to remember? What do you remember about him? He was Shia. So we had a long discussion about Bukhari's unlikely teachers. That was one of them. He was number one on that list. So the first hadith in Kitab al-Iman comes from one of his teachers who was Shia. So I'm not going to talk about that now. We'll just leave that as a thought going into next week. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Uh, Abu Dawood said, كان محترقا شيعيا. He was a burning Shia, like a... <laughs> Claiming Shia. Ubaidullah ibn Musa is right there. It's the... Well, okay, let me ask you, did Bukhari accept him with the fold of Islam? What do you think? You don't know, he's relating hadith from him. If he wasn't, he would not be relating a hadith from him. Yes, of course he did. Yeah. Yeah, this is Bukhari's time, the first 200 years, right? That's different from the, the later sects that developed the 12 verse and other... They couldn't have been 12 words. The 12th Imam didn't come here. This is, by this time, how many Imams did they have? Maybe three or four or five by this point? Allah Alam. Okay. Jazakum Allah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anna astaghfirka wa natubu ilayk. Next week, we will start at 8.15 rather than 8.30, inshallah. No, but the previous class doesn't finish in time. We still need like a short 15 minute break in between.